attention humanitarian and development professionals. Are you looking to take your career to the next level? Then you've come to the right place. Humanitarian Global offers self-paced online courses designed specifically for you. With our comprehensive curriculum, you'll build your capacity in the most critical areas of humanitarian and development work. Our course offerings include monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning, water, sanitation and hygiene, disaster risk reduction and management, food security and nutrition in emergencies, procurement and supply chain management, human nutrition and dietetics, maternal, infant and young child nutrition. With Humanitarian Global, you'll have the opportunity to grow your skills and impact the lives of people in need. Visit our website to learn more about our courses and apply today. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this session. Uh, today, we will be having a webinar trying to be able to put in place the aspects of meal as well as uh, data analysis. And we'll be looking at meal data analysis for effective learning and storytelling. Uh, my name is Sheila. I'm the academic registrar at Humanitarian Global, and I will be with you all through this one hour session and I do hope that you will take up this advantage to be able to um, learn more about what we have in stock. So I need the, uh, yes. So that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you everyone for joining this session. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of comments from the chat as well as the Q&A as well. And I would also encourage you to use those features as they're very, very important, especially even when we get to bring our, moder our trainer on board for this particular purpose. But for now, I want us to introduce ourselves. So I will just allow uh, some of my colleagues who are on board to be able to just say hi so that you know who have been you know, part of the team uh, in making this webinar a success. So they'll just introduce yourselves and even us as participants, we can also use the chat feature just tell us your name and also which country you're from so that you also get to know you. But for now, they may give this mic to our, to our colleagues uh, to introduce themselves. And I think I'll start with um, Brian. Brian, kindly unmute and say hi to the team. Everyone. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Brian, I'm part of the team from Humanitarian Global. Um, just making sure that um, this event is a success and uh, we look forward to a resourceful event. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian, for that. Uh, now I want to introduce Ian to just say hi. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone from uh, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Ian. I represent the business development team at uh, Humanitarian Global and I'm happy to be here with you uh, today. Good, good. Thank you so that so much for that. And then we'll have also uh, Anthony and Leon Mutes and say hi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sheila, and uh, hello everyone. Uh, happy to be part of this session, the first uh, webinar at uh, Humanitarian Global for the year 2024. And uh, we look forward to many more. So thank you so much for joining and uh, feel free to uh, reach out to us on the chat section in case of any challenge. So thank you so much and uh, back to you, Sheila. Great. Thank you so much, Anthony, for that. And then we'll have also our expert for the day who'll just come in to just say hi, and then later on she'll take over the session. But for now, Lydia, you can just say hi. Hi, everyone. Hope you can all hear me. Uh, my name is Lydia Wafula, uh, part of the Humanitarian Global Team, and looking forward to the session. Thank you, Sheila. Great. Thank you so much, Lydia, for that. And uh, I want to also take this time to bring back Ian and a ship he prepares because I'm sure he has something to tell us. What do we have in store uh, for you guys in the month of February? The January has ended, so now we are getting into February. So uh, Ian will be telling us what he has in store for that. And as he prepares to come in, I want to say hi to people who have been able to uh, put in their chats. We are having Ozile, we are having Betty, we are having Ishak, we are having Abi Salam, we are having Emmanuel, we are having Alira, we are having Charles. So many guys coming from different parts of the world just wanting to know more about monitoring and evaluation as well as data analysis. So let's keep on coming, invite your friends, invite your colleagues so that you can try as much as you can to learn more about these two aspects. Ian? 
Great, uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for this opportunity. I'd also like to invite you and welcome you for, for this session. Please, uh, if you're able to, you can also share the link uh, with your colleagues so that uh, we're all able to learn together. Today, we have an interesting topic that we're talking about, which is uh, mail data analysis for effective learning and uh, storytelling. And again, I reiterate that uh, mail is quite critical in every aspect of the project, uh, of any project that we're implementing at community level. And I want to invite you once again to join us. But before that, I know it's a new year. I uh, forgot to mention Happy New Year to everyone. I hope uh, we are all back to work and uh, we are having an amazing time just getting back to work. Let me also turn on my camera probably as I'm given rights to do that. So this year we have some good things that uh, we have, uh, have in store for you. And I know uh, capacity building is quite critical for us as professionals. And uh, it's quite important to keep uh, aware uh, or to be very aware in terms of building our, our skills and our capacities, especially for us as male professionals. As you know, we are involved in every aspect of uh, the project from initiation all the way to completion of the project. And uh, for that, uh, as Humanitarian Global this year, we've come up with a training calendar, and I'm sure this will excite you even as you consider to join one of our training uh, workshops. So we have training in 10 different categories, but most importantly and uh, critical for today's session, I'd just like to talk about two in about two or three minutes, and I'll give it back to Sheila so that we can get back to the session. So uh, we have uh, training workshops in uh, monitoring and evaluation. Uh, let me just share my screen briefly so that uh, we can all keep track of, uh, of that. Okay, great. So we have a training workshops in uh, monitoring and eval uh, evaluation. So we have a number of trainings, but I'd just like to uh, speak over one which is coming up uh, in this coming week from the 5th of February to the 16th of February. And this is monitoring and evaluation for humanitarian and development projects. As I mentioned, uh, meal is quite critical for us as uh, professionals in every aspect of the life cycle of projects that we are working on. And again, this training is just suited for every person who is engaged at different uh, different capacities or different levels within uh, any project that you're implementing as an organization. And the objectives of this training is just to enable you to understand the principles of uh, monitoring and evaluation, to understand uh, the different methods of data collection, uh, how to use MND frameworks in the projects that you are currently uh, running, and also implementing an effective project using uh, MD tools. And uh, the training is offered in two uh, models. So we have the physical class happening right here in Nairobi. Uh, if you'd like to make your way, the training will be happening from uh, uh, in Nairobi at our training center. Uh, but uh, the, the one happening next week will be an online class, which will run for 10 days uh, from the 5th to the 16th of February. And I'd invite everyone to just be part of this class. We, be, uh, we will be able to share the link uh, to the application in the chat section. And uh, please uh, register yourself so that you're able to be part of this class. The training fee for that is $500. And uh, we do look forward to be you being part of that. Remember, at the end of the session, uh, you stand to gain certification uh, through our partnership with uh, HPAS and uh, CPD UK. And this will be an, uh, a very good way for you to learn more about your skills uh, in mill. And also, in addition to that, uh, we also have another training coming up in uh, data analytics and visualization using uh, specifically using SPSS and Power BI. So today's topic is quite interesting because we are talking about meal data analysis and this training is, well, is also going to be critical for you in order to learn how to tell stories, to use the different tools that is SPSS in, and Power BI in this context to be able to visualize and tell stories from uh, your data. The training will also be happening between the 5th to the 16th of February. Uh, the training fee is also $500. Uh, dollars. And uh, the essence of this training is just to help you understand the different function, uh, functionalities of SPSS, uh, determine the different usage, uh, perform uh, tests, parametric and non-parametric tests using uh, the programs, uh, also get to understand about simple regression and uh, multivariate analysis, uh, also get the 360 overview of Power BI, uh, fundamentals of Power BI as well, and also how to perform data visualizations uh, using uh, Power BI. So I'd like to just uh, tell you that it's quite important for you to be uh, skilled in this uh, tool. So if you'd like uh, to be part of that, please, uh, uh, I'll be able to share the links to uh, the, the training workshops for you to make your application. 
and uh, one of our colleagues will be able to get in touch with you just to ensure that you are able to complete your registration uh, for the same training. As I mentioned, at the completion of the training, we will issue certification for you, and I'd like to invite you to not miss out uh, on that class. So we, we also have uh, different uh, trainings in other aspects, but for today, I'd like to just focus on those two. And uh, please don't miss out on that. It's going to be an, an, an amazing time just to get to interact with Lydia and other trainers as well for uh, for these classes, just to be able to build our capacity in the aspect of meal and uh, data analytics set and, visual, uh, and visualization. So thank you so much. I'll give it back to Sheila so that we can get back to the program of the day. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Ian. And uh, you reminded me I had not said Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you all. And even as we start, you have seen we have very good stuff for February. Please try as much as you can to be able to take that chance. How best would it be to learn two software programs at the same time? It will be very, very uh, something that you will really want to enjoy uh, doing. So special shout out to Mark Lusim from Kenya, Josephine Malia from South Sudan, Johannes Dugumba from Ethiopia, Francis, thank you so much for joining. I'm also seeing Samuel Nguala from Malawi, Kasim from Somalia. I'm also seeing Gabriel from uh, South Sudan, Adan from Somalia, Jusu from uh, Malawi again. Yeah, Zandile from es Eswatini, thank you. Uh, Michael also from Juba, Barak from Kenya, Francis from Zimbabwe, Ernest from Rwanda. Thank you so much for joining. I'm trying as much as I can to read how many people who are there? Karen from Kenya, thank you. Charles, thank you, Isaac, and every one of you. And also, Abiriza Hassan, thank you so much. So with that, I would want to start what we have in store for you, even as you prepare. I hope you have your pen and paper ready and anything that will help you to pick a few points, even as we continue. Dakar from Senegal, and then I'll bring on board Lydia. And as Lydia prepares, I would want you to use the chat feature and the Q&A section. So if you have any questions, even as Lydia presents, I will request to type in your questions and then we'll be able to answer them as we continue, as well as at the end of the session, we will be able to give you guys time to be able to ask the questions so that we can all be able to participate in the same. With that, uh, allow me to bring on board Lydia and then I'll come in later on. Thank you so much, Lydia, and welcome. Uh, thanks, Sheila, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in. So, Happy New Year, and hope you're all well, wherever you are. So, just, I think we'll dive in, uh, because we've been, we've had an extensive introduction. Um, so, for today's session, uh, what we are looking at is, um, it's a part one of how do we use our data just as we've collected data. Um, how do we use it just to ensure that we effectively learn from it and effectively tell stories that can be able to be utilized in our various fields of um, the humanitarian community that we work with, uh, we work in. So I'll call this a part one. Then a part two, hopefully we'll have where we'll now be able to see how do we even develop stories? How do we develop long, la short learning pieces that we can use um, just to ensure that we communicate to our target audience, to our stakeholders, even to our donors. Um, in addition to, of course, the very serious reports that we always have, because those ones always have to have a flow, they always have to have a design. So how do we just simplify the outputs of the analysis that we always carry out? So with that, allow me to dive in. Um, so today, just look at that analysis for effective learning and storytelling, and just unpacking it. This whole... Um, the male thing that we are calling it. So I am sure we all are aware. So monitoring just the continuous assessment of project activities to inform uh, in implementation and um, decision making during uh, the whole process or the whole project cycle. Evaluation is usually systematic and objective uh, assessment of um, the projects to, to determine whether they are relevant, effective, efficient, impactful, and sustainable. Uh, this happens mid or towards the end of a program activity. Uh, what about accountability? Just being able to that we are sure 
that we are responsible of our actions and decisions that we make and to ensure that they are ethical, they're transparent and in participatory manner, just to ensure that we involve all our stakeholders and the community members that we work with. And definitely, how do we learn from all this, from the data that we are collecting, from the decisions that we make? We always have to learn from it to ensure that we change, we innovate uh, throughout the process so that the outcomes that we intend to achieve are always um, at par with the feedback that we receive. Um, uh, so usually in monitoring and evaluation, the ideal situation is that we'll all, we always have goals. We have objectives, intermediate results, outputs and activities that always follow in that order. But usually in the real world or when we go to the ground, uh, usually you'll find that that imperfect information that you thought is not helpful is very critical during making decisions. And that MND data helped us to reduce uh, the gap, the information gap, but not really eliminate it or deal away with it. So we always just fill in the gaps, small gaps here and there that we find as we continue during the implementation. And data quality and timelines so for reporting are key. So the reporting is all, whether you are telling a story, you're developing a case study or a blog, you have to ensure that it's timely and the data that you're using is of good quality just to ensure that it gives you that uh, almost perfect um, evidence or feedback that you need to be able to utilize it in your implementation. And of course, you always have to expect the unexpected or what you do not you had not anticipated uh, to occur. And this will always help you always be able to uh, make information or make changes or make innovations as you go along um, in your implementation. So ideally, what can we say is the relationship between MND uh, learning and storytelling? So here I just have some questions to probe our thinking. Because with all this, uh, the presentation today, it's more of a trigger and a thought process um, rather than learning. So I just want as as even you listen through, try to relate back to the work that we do in the humanitarian sector, in the monitoring and evaluation, in the research, in all that we do. So the relationship between the two, like when you look at the reports, case studies and write-ups, do they really reflect our best thinking or do they um, fulfill certain organizational or donor requirements? Um, are we ref do we always reflect critically on data collected and information gathered when we are working on stories or we are looking when we are learning? Uh, do we always turn the data into effective and efficient information for project decision making and learning purposes? Or do we just write the report and throw it there? So just to trigger uh, what we look at. When we look at now today, we want to see stories and learning. What kind of stories could provide key information about a specific information from the data that we've collected? Uh, so specific situation could be in terms of, for example, if we are dealing with um, malnutrition cases, if we are dealing with climate change right now, we are dealing with uh, gender-based violence, we are dealing with um, aspects of education, we are dealing with aspects of war wherever we are working or uh, instability in communities. Do those stories that we hear, do they provide any key information that uh, based on the data that we collect? Um, and when you look at it, what is the best story that you've ever had? The best story is not really about a story being positive, but it can also be a negative story that is very impactful that you always carry it in your mind when you are working with communities or when you are in the board meetings, talking to people about the work we do, what is that story that you think is best or very impactful that you've had? What do you remember about the story? And why do you remember, uh, why do you remember it? What did you really learn from the story? And are you able to relate that story with the real life situations that happen? When you go to the community and you see stories about malnutrition or when you see stories about food insecurity, do you, can you be able to relate that to other circumstances or to different situations? Are you able to place yourself or imagine yourself in those situations? So these are the main reflections that I want today's presentation to center around, just to see 
when we collect data and we say data can help us do this, place yourself in that situation and see, can you able to relate it? How good was that story? Are you able to remember it? Why are you even remembering it? Um, so when you go further, we start with the data analysis and, and, and learning. So data analysis and learning are literally two sides of the same coin, uh, because for every data that you collect, it's because you want to learn something from it uh, to enable you make informed decisions, to improve your interventions or activities uh, that you do, and definitely better respond to crises or better respond to situations that you find on the ground. And the way they two interact or intersect is um, it helps in decision making and strategic planning. Uh, because data provides insights uh, that are very key for decision making, for planning, and the data can be used, of course, to make, uh, to forecast what is needed, uh, maybe help in uh, conducting needs assessment, to be able to mitigate risks, and aid in adapting of strategies accordingly. So this is just to ensure that when we start to raise our projects, we always have strategies, but in between when you collect data, when you're doing monitoring, you'll find that maybe those strategies need to be tweaked a bit. Maybe you need to uh, re-strategize on how you had planned initially. So this is very important when you look at that and when you're learning as you implement. Uh, in terms of knowledge sharing, of course, it's very critical. This helps in ensuring that um, in the humanitarian community and the community members that you work with or the participants that you work with out there. Uh, that coordination, that collaboration and innovation between the all this and the synergy with, within the circle that you work with, it's very critical because it helps with the knowledge sharing and the learning. Learning from the community members, uh, putting in uh, the local knowledge, putting in the expert knowledge and ensuring that you get uh, a very good um, participatory uh, good participatory uh, between the various communities to ensure that you are able to achieve effectively or maximally uh, what you had intended to achieve. Uh, of course, for advocacy and accountability, it helps in terms of supporting uh, advocacy efforts and promoting accountability. Uh, because for accountability, you have to collect that data. You need feedback from the community members. You need feedback from the stakeholders and even your team members to be able to ensure that you are literally going in the right track, or you are able to at least step back and reflect and say, this is what is really happening. Can we try to readjust? Can we try to uh, look at it and say, maybe raise awareness from what the other community members experiences? Can we use that and raise awareness to the other community members that are not yet experiencing or that we've not yet collected to them rather than literally uh, starting from zero or reinventing the wheel. This helps us in ensuring that you can get that information, get those stories and use the same stories as a basis uh, or awareness creation, uh, conduct sensitization, and even use the same stories to drive policy or to enhance policy discussions in uh, where we have policy makers. Um, uh, when you go to storytelling, why, what is the relation between data analysis and storytelling and why literally storytelling uh, and not reports? Why storytelling and not case studies? Why storytelling and not um, maybe doing something else? Uh, reason being is that uh, storytelling uses words to create new worlds and experiences in a reader or listener's imagination because it triggers, storytelling always triggers one's imagination. Uh, it, of course, impacts human emotions because uh, a good story should always be able to trigger your emotion. Uh, a, story, a good story will can be able to lead people to accept original ideas and encourage them to take action. Uh, and this is because it can be able to relate. You relate your data, um, the information you get, the tables and graphics tell a simple story around it, create a context which we'll see, and now be able to tell, to make people accept it, makes it easier to be accepted. Uh, and of course, it simplifies the outputs of data analysis and makes them relatable to the target audience. So just a quote from uh, one author and screenwriter, Bud Schulberg, uh, he says that uh, when done right, a story socks the eye, uh, and the ear and the solar plexus 
all at once. So literally a good story should be able to have almost all your senses uh, into a month into that story, be able to captivate if it's a visual, if it's a live audience or someone telling the story right away, you should be able to be captivated, your ears of course, and everything, all the senses will be captivated by a good story. So what is the intersection between? So for an effective uh, data story, it's usually made up of six components. So there's of course data, which will back up the story. There's analysis, which is critical because it provides the pattern and all that. There's the narrative. How do you narrate a good story? How do you visualize the, the context and how do you deliver the story? So when we start with the data-driven narratives, uh, data analysis often it uncovers patterns, trends, and insights. And uh, storytelling is usually an avenue through which the insights are communicated um, effectively and efficiently to the stakeholders. So instead of just presenting, we usually write reports. So instead of just presenting a report that has just figures and tables and discussion, uh, usually you can include a story, a short story, um, where you can it can illustrate a problem it can highlight its significance and propose a solution. So just a good story that is relatable to the to the stakeholders, but is also relatable to the context and the situation that you are analyzing from the data that you've collected. Um, so the second one is con contextualizing the insights. Um, that analysis provides the raw material, which is the data, but usually storytelling at the context. So this is somehow related to the discussions that we do. When you're writing a report, you always refer to uh, the other cases that have happened before, other instances in other contexts or in similar contexts in different regions that are similar to the region or the context that you're working with. So these, um, it, storytelling helps to frame data uh, within uh, the broader business or so societal context. So helping the con uh, stakeholders the community members that we work with to understand the implications and help us make informed decisions. And for stakeholders, it's not just the outer people, it's usually also the program participants, the program team members or the implementers of the program. You're able to add context and understand what is really the implication and be able to make the informed decisions uh, that are really key and in helpful. So storytelling uh, helps in the engagement persuasion. So as I've said, it's a reiteration that a good story will captivate the, the audience and persuade them to take action based on the insights uh, derived from data. So usually it appeals to the emotions and logic of the target audience. That is how it's supposed to work around that. A good story, literally you'll always remember, it will be retained in your memory. Uh, rather than a big report or a whole research paper. Uh, usually, yes, you'll remember, but maybe bits and bits where mostly you're interested. But a good story, if it's short, precise, which is supposed to be uh, presenting all the cases right, then you'll always remember it and you're able to literally um, act upon it and relate it to it further. So by weaving data into a narrative structure, analysts can increase the likelihood that their insights will be retained and acted upon, uh, rather than you, you as an analyst, you as an MND or a project officer have to keep on reminding people. But when a story is it, someone will always have that in memory and relate to a situation that they're able to easily relate to. So it's an interactive uh, interactive process. Uh, usually um, when we explore data, we always uncover new insights that require adjustments to the narrative. So what happens is that uh, feedback on the storytelling process may prompt further analysis to refine or def uh, validate the narrative. So this is uh, working hand in hand or two sides of the coin whereby even as you write your analysis, you uncover things, a story, when you're working on a story or developing a story, you'll always identify the loopholes that will prompt someone or will prompt further analysis just to ensure that you have that rich story based on the data that is being collected. Uh, so it has to appeal to the emotions. I um, think I've reiterated that enough. 
So it has to ensure that it invokes different types of emotions. It has to invoke empathy. It has to invoke curiosity, uh, agency, uh, which makes people, the audience relatable and triggers inter, uh, triggers engagement uh, between the audience and among the audience and the person uh, presenting the story. Storytelling helps us to visualize data effectively because it helps us to just comprehend and have that visual um, imagination of how that data appears. How does this data appear and how does it look like when you when a report is presented um, Usually you'll just read it as a report, but when a story is told, you'll somehow your mind takes you to that situation, placing you in a situation for you to try to imagine these people that are being affected by climate change. You can really tell, like your imagination can take you and for you to just immerse yourself and see how is it? How are they being affected? The numbers in terms of maybe production decrease, how is the production re decrease in that number rather than for example, an analyst just saying, oh yeah, the last two years we had uh, 10 bags uh, of production per acre, but this year we, the last year because of maybe poor harvest, we only had two bags. Yeah, it's there, but when it's a story, made it into a story, then you can really feel it and take yourself there. You should, of course, definitely a story will always create a memorable experience. People will always remember stories. Audiences will always remember stories. Stakeholders and the people that maybe we target, for example, will always remember stories better and easier than just as presenting data. Not unless, especially if they're not oriented towards data or they are oriented towards uh, monitoring and evaluation, then stories will always be better. Uh, um, so when we look at these, what is the, really the difference between storytelling and reporting? So stories usually have scenes. Someone telling a story will always create a scene, like the beginning of a scene, the context of the scene, and how did that story end? What was the conclusion? Was it a good ending? Was it a bad ending? Was it positive or negative? And what are, are the lessons learned from it? Um, in a storytelling, characters speak to each other, and this is mostly, especially if it's a live audience, um, Stories are better when they're live audiences. Um, it can also be written, definitely. And when this, you just say, this is a story of Lydia, of how Lydia uh, became a farmer. So it's easy when you pick one person from out of the beneficiaries that you work with and just say, this is a story, two or three paragraphs, this is a story of Lydia became a farmer from her shifting. Or this is how the story of Lydia's nutrition improved that. Uh, so a story will always trigger our imagination and will always feel we are part of the scenes and the context in that story or in that setting. Unlike a report, which usually when we read a report, we always want to see, oh, what is the objective? So you read a report in your mind, you always look at, does, has it answered the objective that well, it was intended to answer um, or not? So that is always what will be always in your mind. And maybe you'll always try to go and pick what is relevant to you. You're like, yeah, these objectives is what is relevant to me. This other objective is not. But for a story, because it's short and everything, it will give you everything packed, all the data that you need, all the scenarios that you need, and it will always make you have the whole package of a scenario. Uh, so good stories are always concise, but not enough details to uh, but how always have enough details to paint a vivid picture. Um, unlike a report, a report, the more you summarize, the more some things might miss out, not unless you only have maybe one objective or so. And of course, when you're collecting data, you always have to use all the data somehow, majority of the data, just to see how the different data points relate to your objective. Good stories engage the emotions of the listeners. So all aspects of the emotions. Um, so in our humanitarian world, how do we apply the stories uh, or how are stories used? So stories can be used to promote a culture of effective and meaningful dialogue between program staff and beneficiaries or participants. Um, some organizations nowadays call them participants rather than beneficiaries. Um, 
A good story will enable organizations to translate individual experiences into a shared resource. So ideally you document those stories and those stories will be used as case studies. They'll be used to develop um, work plans. They will be used to develop um, activities or strategies or even innovations around how you now implement your activities or other project activities in other areas or even to the same communities, just going to ensure that you, you innovate, you ensure that you learn from what they are experiencing or their stories to be able to ensure that you literally effectively reach out to them or impact their livelihoods. Uh, the third one is exploring the risks and opportunities presented by an event, challenge, a situation, um, an implementation methodolo methodology or reactivity. So this ensures that those risks and opportunities are presented or that are encountered are able to be factored in a story can be told about a risk, a story can be told about an opportunity, and that becomes more enticing rather than someone just presenting, or oh, the opportunity is maybe this and this. Yeah, it's it might be short, but when you relate it to a story, it becomes more easy. You are able even to relate, not just in one sector, but in different sectors uh, in, the, in the humanitarian world. So, just to sum it up, every person can tell a story. I'm sure we all know of people who can tell stories, starting from our families, not even far off. Um, and usually in our family, you'll always find that one person who will always tell very good, enticing stories. So, but what is the art of storytelling to ensure that it's transformative and it's infective? And ensure that now that we are in the working space, ensure that it is backed up by data. You just don't tell a story. And when I ask you for the facts and you have no facts. So a good story need to have facts. It has to be transformative. It has to be backed up data by data as you've seen, we have seen. So some of the key aspects of um, a transformative story will be the narrative. Um, the narrative has to be good it has to have to influence the setting it has to um, provide context to everything that you do uh, to ensure that there is better understanding a transformative story has to have to grab the attention of the audience uh, just to ensure that they resonate with it uh, and this is mostly because you need to have different aspects to ensure that the audience are able to grab or to get the, you need to to ensure that you grab the attention of the audience it could be through asking questions it could be through creating suspense it could be through having an eventful unexpected ending where it will people leave people with answers and questions and that could trigger their 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 creativity it could trigger now more further discussions for you to be able to work with uh, a story story should be of course interactive uh, just to ensure that your audience are able to respond you're able to engage uh, with your audience you're able to connect and interact and this is be if you're doing the live or if you are just writing the story, that someone can pick it and be able to even ask you further questions from that story. Someone can pick it and be able to go and apply that story and say, hey, this situation of malnutrition, we also have malnutrition in my case. So how can I use malnutrition? Uh, the case, for example, of a region in Kenya is has the similar socio-ecological or geographical aspects, for example, like a region in either Somalia or a region in Sudan or a region in Ethiopia or even far beyond Malawi. Like, how do I use that in the context that I am in? And when I'm applying it, maybe I can be able to reach out to Sheila and say, hi, Sheila. So this is what I've used and this is what I've gotten. Do you think maybe I've missed it out just from your story? Uh, and of course, a transformative story should be imaginative. As much as you tell someone a story, you should always leave these points for them to always imagine and for them to follow and ensure that they're part of the story. Um, the stories that will always tell, yes, you tell, for a report, it will give you everything. Uh, the only thing is that you look at it and you're like, oh yeah, so... 
uh, maybe this is what was missed and this. But for a story, always ensure that you point, uh, you paint a visual uh, imagination of the people. Ensure that you have a detailed aspect of the characters in what you are talking about, the settings and the events that are occurring, just to ensure that it pulls that imagination, the memories, um, it carries the memories of people along. Um, so that is mostly, those are the key. They are way more beyond than that, where you'll have uh, stories that maybe need to be uh, more than that, stories that maybe uh, you have to ensure that you have that additional skills uh, that you need. As uh, Stories that, for example, you provide feedback, especially if it's a live session, ensure that there's always feedback when you're telling a story so that it can be in, um, as um, interactive, as informative as possible. Uh, you ensure that you also collect feedback from the story and you listen to the audience. Um, and uh, just to wrap it up, learning and data analysis are two sides of the same coin. So you can't you can't do analysis and not learn from it, or you can't learn without having facts or figures to back it up. Uh, a good story should be understood, should it should be experienced, and it should be related uh, or relatable to our day to day work, our day to day um, activities, uh, our day to day decision making, and uh, storytelling is an art. So it requires creativity, it requires vision, it requires skill, and definitely practice. Just as writing is an art, storytelling is an art. And um, that's why we'll hopefully have a session two or a part two of this webinar to just unpack how do you tell a story? I know people feel it's very simple, but how do you tell a story to capture people to do that? and how do you write a story? How do you write a report? What I'm sure most of us know. How do you write a case study and all that? So with all that, um, thank you. I hope we have enough time to uh, ask questions and respond to some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lydia, for, for that. And I'm happy to hear and see that a lot of us are saying the presentations are well done and they've been able to understand. Uh, kindly note that we will share this presentation and the recordings by close of business uh, tomorrow. So please ensure you get that. And uh, as as we are, uh, it will be good for us to ask a few questions, given that this has really juggled our minds and we have a few things to, you know, put across. So I'll give uh, a chance to some of us to be able to ask the questions live. However, I have a few comments that I can be able to ask you, Lydia, as we continue. So if you have a question, you can raise up your hand, and then I'll pick at least three people to be able to, you know, ask their questions live. But in the meantime, Johannes is saying people are more attentive on storytelling, especially when you forward it via indigenous community for target population. Very good comment from Johannes there. Then for the question, I'll start with the first question. Lydia, I hope you're, here, you're there with me. Are outcomes yes. not included in mail? Are outcomes not included in mail? Sure. You can answer. Mm -hmm. uh, outcomes, oh, I go back to this. I think this yes. is it. <laughs> outcomes are definitely included. So outcomes will be more at uh, output there the higher output level, but the higher at a higher level. Usually we have intermediate results and then outcomes, and, uh, sorry, outputs and then outcomes. Mm -hmm. So outcomes are definitely included at MEL and they are very critical for you to be able to measure your indicators. So yes, they are included. Uh, good, thank yeah. you for that. Uh, as I asked the question, I'm seeing, uh, Everyone is ready with their questions. I think I'll start with, um, we can have uh, Nelson Mandela. Hi, Nelson, you can uh, you can yeah. ask your question. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Yes, uh, I'm really so impressed though. I am like, I joined it late because I was cap captured. Uh, by work just mm -hmm. why I could not be able to lock it in time mm -hmm. however uh, when I realized that the presentation is going on 
when I mm -hmm. see uh, the, the, the prescription of the of the slide, it's really detailed. Okay. And then uh, I really appreciate the work of the of the presenter or the facilitator. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so yeah. much, Nelson. Thank you so okay. much for that com for that compliment. I believe um uh Lydia, you've had that wonderful comment from Nelson. Thank you, Nelson. Okay. Um can I bring on board Saddam? Saddam Hassan Osman. Saddam Hassan Osman. Saddam Is... Hassan Osman. Yes, you can ask your question. So far, uh, I come lately for the attending this program. So mm -hmm. please provide summary. So it has passed away almost one hour. Oh. The event. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that, Saddam. But we'll definitely share the recordings and the presentation later on. So it will be easier for you to follow through even hopefully by tomorrow you'll receive it in your emails then you can okay. easily catch up you know from what you missed is that okay 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 good. okay okay thank you you're welcome good, good thank you then we have a question from Batsirai. does storytelling have a structure or format which can be followed and uh, is it recommended to include photos and direct quotations so does storytelling have a structure or format which can be followed? And is it recommended to include photos and direct quotation? Uh, thank you. Uh, definitely it has a structure. That's why I said, um, hopefully we'll have a face, uh, a part two of this webinar. So this was the introduction just to see. So a, a part two will now go to now the storytelling itself. How do you structure your story? A story has has a structure. You have mm -hmm. to have the beginning or the introduction uh, to say to set the mood or the setting uh, to provide the scene. It has to mm -hmm. have now the the main body where now you tell your scenario or you describe the scenario or the event that you want to describe, and then mm -hmm. definitely the conclusion where now you will have to see. What are the lessons? What are the recommendations even that you get from that whole story? And of course, for a good story, when you're writing, um, because mm -hmm. of course, when you're telling a story, you can't write a picture. <laughs> but mm -hmm. when you are writing a story, for example, you've just written a summary and you want to talk about a story of humanitarian, maybe global, you have to include a picture, definitely. Pictures always communicate. We say pictures communicate a thousand words. So you yes. definitely include a picture. You'll definitely mm -hmm. include direct quotations from the people that you've collected the stories from. That mm -hmm. always, always makes it even more um, uh, more persuasive and even mm -hmm. more interactive and even mm -hmm. more human. It keeps that human touch when you have those direct quotations from the people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, another question, as I wait to see who else has raised up their hand, how do you use data to tell stories and illustrate problems? You can give examples if you can. How do you use data to tell stories and illustrate problems? Uh, just give an example. And as you answer that, I think you can also include, is there a specific limit of words to be included in storytelling while executing the role of male? Is there a specific limit of words to be included in storytelling? Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'll start with the limit of words. For limit mm -hmm. of words, I'd, for a story to be memorable and uh, not boring, because remember, mm -hmm. it's a story, not really a report or a case study. It has to be short and mm -hmm. precise. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to have like three pages of a story or two pages of a story. Mm -hmm. Having one page maximum of a story, that is enough. Actually, three quarters of a page, like four mm -hmm. to five paragraphs. With that, you should have been able to um, give out your context, indicated the situation, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, set out the, the context, um, given the, the exact flesh of it and concluded by either recommending or recommending or taking the indicating the lessons run from that so it has to be at least short and precise not so long mm -hmm. not more than one page if you go mm -hmm. more than that one page then 
you are now back to our rope, our rope of writing a report, but okay. it should be short. Mm -hmm. um, how you can, uh, the aspect of uh, including data to illustrate mm -hmm. a story? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The example I can use is for example, I'll use, sorry for using this case. I know right mm -hmm. now it has, it has these pinpoints, but I know that is the one that uh, most of us are really keenly following. The story of the war happening in uh, Gaza right now. The data that is coming out about, especially around the children and all that, that mm -hmm. data, when you look at it, of course, it triggers your emotions, it triggers your human, it touches your human side of it. But when you pick that data, when you even look at, for example, the reporters, they're picking that data and creating a story around that, either taking someone who's been affected, um, either directly or indirectly, and them illust illustrating or telling a story of how their family members maybe they have been left behind or something has happened to them. That is how you use data. So you go in the field, collect data about, for example, malnutrition, right? And you find that maybe a thousand children or households are affected by malnutrition. From that a thousand, you pick like maybe two people mm -hmm. that have really touched you. Um, remember I said the best story. So it could be good, good, or it could be on the negative. It could be positive or negative. That is a, a story is a story. Um, if it's a best story, we it's it could be both extremes. It could be negative or it could be positive. So you pick a story and as you introduce a, a paragraph, for example, and say, for example, in Makweni district, Makweni is mm -hmm. a county, it's a region in Kenya, in, North, in Eastern Kenya. Say maybe households, a thousand households have been affected by malnutrition uh, in uh, Northern Kenya. And this is a result of lack of rains, lack of food, and this and this and this. That is me setting, setting the background information. When I go out to the context, let's like say now, for example, I went to a family, there are maybe 10 children and the family are not able to afford these and these and these and these. So you set the situation from your data and now you go and pick now an, a specific example that you can include from in the story. And at the end now conclude. When you relate to the data, when you relate the data that you have, the analysis that you've conducted, and maybe those malnutrition indicators that you have, how mm -hmm. do you now conclude or what do you recommend? Do you recommend maybe um, the cash, food for cash program? Do you recommend maybe uh, working with more partners from the health sector to ensure that maybe they provide supplements or to ensure mm -hmm. that there's even, you work with now WFP to ensure that now there's more food supply. You work with the government to ensure there's that advocacy and all that. So in a nutshell, that is already a story. So you set the situation, you pick one person or one scenario that can now have that human touch and then now at the end conclude from the data that you have from the analysis and from that human touch story that you have, how do you conclude? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. And as I bring, I uh, want to give Bilay Shibeshi a chance to ask uh, the question and she, he or she can also ask the question that he has posted on the Q&A. Uh, Bilay? Bilay, you can unmute and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, at what stage uh, do we apply MND strategy? Ah, good one. Uh, so for MND strategy, it will be once you collect your data, uh, once you're writing your story, because by the time you write a story, uh, you already have the data you have analyzed and you want to have that human touch to that uh, data. So where we now have the storytelling. So what you'll do is that as you're analyzing the data and you're writing a story, um, you refer back to your strategy and see based on the work that you are doing, um, is it having the impact that you had desired or is it having the results that you had initially desired or that you had projected based on your strategy, uh, based on your um, goals and the outcomes and mm -hmm. the implementation strategy. If it's not having the desired outcomes, that is now where I mentioned the aspect of trying to see if you can now try to re-strategize or try to innovate around the proposed strategies, just to ensure that 
um, it's helping you to achieve the desired goals and results. So you use that story to ensure that if it's working with the strategy or if it's achieving what you had desired, that is okay. But if it's not, then you have to sit down, go back to the drawing board and see, can we maybe innovate ways? Can we re-strategize and see? Uh, we don't need to have, to, you don't need to change the whole male strategy, but pick pieces and, and see, can we innovate around this? Can we maybe try to innovate our implementation strategy? Because it could be only the implementation strategy of the whole strategy. It could only be the implementation of the whole strategy. It could be maybe how you even include or engage the participants? Are you doing it in a participatory way? Are you, uh, do you have accountability even in your male strategy? How are you ensuring that that feedback from the participants is incorporated in your usual uh, program implementation? So that is how now you look at it, um, just to ensure that is it in sync with your strategy? If it's not, mm -hmm. try to uh, be innovative around that come up with good uh, new ideas, re-strategize. It could, of course, not be the whole uh, strategy, but just a piece of the strategy that maybe you need to rework on. Yeah. OK, OK. Thank you so okay, much, thank India. You. Thank you. Thank you, Billy, for your question. So time is far much gone. And then I'm, I'm seeing I have a lot of questions. So we try as much as we can to at least pick two, and then we can proceed. But as I think I'll give a chance to Maurice Maurice, you can also ask your question that you've posted on uh, Q&A. And as Maurice prepares, please, Olivia, tell us, what is the recommended way to present stories? Do we use first person or third person? Can you hear me? Yes, Maurice, we can hear you. A bit of background noise, but we can hear you. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Ian. And thank you, Lydia. Lydia, your presentation on uh, storytelling uh, in as far as uh, M and E is concerned, was very impressive. Actually, I have learned a lot that uh, maybe I would not have known if I didn't participate in this. Maybe uh, as a polite request, uh, if you have uh, if you have classical examples of uh, stories that uh, really capture all the quality that you spoke about, that you can share, that would be great for us. Otherwise, thank you so much, and uh, I now I'm a customer. I'll be I'll be very frequent here. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. Um, so for this, I think what I can do, I'll work with Sheila uh, to include yes, uh, classical examples into the presentation. Uh, yes, they could and... be write-ups or they could be videos that you can relate to the what is already out there instead of inventing something new. Then yes. now yes, it will yes, be yes. shared out. Yeah. Great. And also, uh, Maurice, uh, you can have also the opportunity to join our upcoming class that you can you can get yeah, those stories and uh, use them uh, very well. Thank you so much for that. Um, Thank you, Sheila. You're welcome. Let's have Lotia Ekwom. Lotia Ekwom. Lotia, Lydia, you sure. can ask uh, an answer the question for us. Uh, first person or third person when presenting stories? Uh, usually the best is first person. Okay. Um, Put yourself in the situation or if someone is uh, narrating, if you're picking someone's story, for example, I'm narrating for Sheila, mm -hmm. then uh, what you do is then do the quote in quote. So this oh, Sheila, yeah. Sheila, Sheila. So the best is always the first, uh, first person, especially when okay. you're narrating, when you're narrating. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. And as we wait for Lotia, Ali Abdullahi, you're, you, you're able to speak? Ali Abdullahi? Ali Abdullahi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good day. Good day, Charles. Yeah, I'm happy to listen to the presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you. I just have a two question. I know that this storytelling is a new innovation into the development world, and it's very interesting. So I want to say that, can you go hand in glove with the main report writing or should it be a standalone presentation whenever we are going for maybe advocacies, community engagement, ETC? So I want to know, can two of them go pari pasu or storytelling can stand alone and uh, serve as a main purpose of engagement? Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank Lydia? you, Charles. Um, I will say in most cases, they'll go hand in hand. 
um, especially when you are um, talking to either program staff or stakeholders or maybe even donors, definitely have a report and have that human touch to the report, which is now the story. For community members, usually for a report, it is usually very technical for them. So you'll mostly give, you'll most maybe give a summary, but the best is pick that data and try to relate it, uh, pick, a, pick the data and try to infuse a story into it, which they will mostly relate to and a story that is mostly related to them. So for example, when you're working in a certain region, pick some, um, pick a case scenario that is the specific data point or the specific person that is now uh, giving that human touch is from that region. They will easily relate to that. Yeah. Maybe even remember that than even the report that you had said. Yeah. So mostly, majorly, uh, hand in hand. Um, but now for community members, it's the story is way better and more memorable and even more easy to visualize and even relate to than a report. So definitely a report will be there, just a summary maybe, but the story will be way better to tell when you're dealing with community members, it's easier for them. But of course, when it's donors and all the others, the program staff, it's always the technical and the story to give the human touch. That always, I think will always have, it will be always sell yeah thank you okay. thank you for that question charles and thank you lydia for answering and i think as we wind up um having a question any tips to improve creativity in story in, to, in storytelling any tips to improve creativity in storytelling just at least two pointers uh so any tips mm -hmm. so i think the first will be there are several actually um mm -hmm. The first will be to ensure that um, your story has a human touch. Mm -hmm. Your story always has a human touch uh, because we remember we are dealing with monitoring evaluation of humanitarian and mm -hmm. the people that you work with. Always ensure that the story you talk has a human touch. It's not just in the vacuum. You just don't create a story. So mm -hmm. it has a human touch. And two, it's always backed up with the data because we're still relating MND and data and we are trying somehow to simplify the technical reports that we write to have that human touch to evoke emotions and to make the people that make decisions, people that implement policies, people that craft policies to be relatable to the work that we do or the data that we collect. So mm -hmm. as we know, even you as even us as the MND team or the technical team or even implementers, when someone sends you a big report, the first thing you ask is, do you have a summarized version of this? Or you just mm -hmm. go to the summary and that is it. But for storytelling, using that data, always it can back up. So first, as I've said, those are the main things. One, human touch. Two, ensure that it has, um, that it's backed up by data. It's backed up by facts and figures mm -hmm. that you can always defend, that you can always refer to in case someone wants the, the full story or the full picture okay. out of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think uh, we would have to stop from there. Uh, we'll have to stop there. I will request uh, Molai Mose to ask the last question. And then for the other questions that we already have, um, we will be giving out answers as we continue. So if you have a question on uh, Q&A, please just wait, uh, even as the session ends, so that we can be able to type your answer for you. And also for the remaining ones, we'll be sharing on our Discord platform, which the link has been will be shared in the in the chat in in a minute by one of my colleagues. So now you can also get in touch, you know, with us, get to know what we are doing. That will be the best platform where you can also interact with Lydia and uh, the rest of the team in terms of any question you have on uh, monitoring and evaluation as well as the aspects of that. Mola, you can ask your question. Okay, okay. As we wait for Molai, uh, Lydia, you can answer this one question. Is there a difference between storytelling and a case story? Yes, there is. And do we need to ensure that we have a signed consent when telling the story, e.g. when making a presentation to the donor or, uh, or not writing or publishing? Do we need to have a signed consent? Definitely. 
because remember you'll be using someone's name someone's mm -hmm. identification and where possible photos and all mm -hmm. that so mm -hmm. always ensure of course you have their consent um mm -hmm. if possible written or even recorded just in mm -hmm. case of anything mm -hmm. yes definitely so consent is important yeah okay okay thank so, you so much for that Mulai so, moses are you yeah, there this is Mulai moses um i was just appealing uh, for the time difference so it was our mm -hmm. disadvantage by the time i connected i was almost late and the mm -hmm. topic was very important you know in mm -hmm. Australia, we are two hours behind the mm -hmm. thing at time so and i was stuck in the traffic ah. while coming to the office oh sorry so i'll uh -huh. just uh, that's that's something you need to consider in future yes discussion like yes. this thank you moses definitely thank you moses we will try as much as we can we can be alerting you when it's about to start so please join sure. our discord platform so that yeah, we'll be sure. sending those updates there and then you can okay. yes I'll, the session I'll is about that. to start good okay. thank you so yeah. much for that yeah, I you're think welcome that marks the end of our today's webinar. I want to give a special thanks to the team of Humanitarian Global for making it a success. I believe each one of us has seen that the webinar has been a success. I thank you so much for that. We'll be having more as we continue. So you can always lock the date. Uh, Wednesday is 11, 12 p.m. East African time. We always have something good for you. So do check our website, do check uh the Discord platform again for any more of this so that now you 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 increase your knowledge on what is what that is happening in the humanitarian field. With that, allow me to end there. I wish you all well and see you the next time. Thank you and goodbye. 86% of organizations value professionals that upskill to advance their careers. It's never too late. Enroll for a self-paced online course today and get to enjoy a 10% discount. Our courses are monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning, water, sanitation and hygiene, disaster risk reduction and management, food security and nutrition in emergencies, procurement and supply chain management, human nutrition and dietetics, maternal and infant young child nutrition, 